Now in our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1,218 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Amateurs from coast to coast and all across Canada participated in AWRL Field Day as it lit up the bands last weekend. We will have coverage on the reported scoring so far. Ham Radio, the international amateur radio exhibition held each year in Europe, is now in the books. We will tell you all about it. An earthquake emergency drill was held in Southern California to test amateur radio wind link capabilities. We will have a special report. The Hurricane WatchNet is keeping an eye on a few tropical depressions and may need to activate if things take a turn for the worse. The founder of Alpha Amplifiers has become a silent key. An historic transmitter will remain off the air. We will tell you why. All this and we will go to the local big box mart shopping for those elusive satellite QSOs. That's all straight ahead as This Week in Amateur Radio takes to the air in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, asks if you are afraid or worried about up and coming technologies and will answer the question, is it safe to buy third party lithium ion batteries? We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Australia's own Anil Benshop, VK6FLAB, is curious and asks, if you had the money, what would your amateur adventure look like? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of his special summer series entitled The Amateur Radio History Headlines. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will be here to tell you what you should be on the lookout for when performing a tower and antenna inspection. All of that and a lot more is straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting this week from the studios of K2MST in the Museum of Science and Technology in Armory Square, Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from a muggy Troy, New York news bureau, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And reporting from the Western Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where we're celebrating Happy Birthday America, 4th of July, where the cookout, some flags, and eh, maybe a few fireworks. I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau on this 4th of July weekend, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we just had a few days where summer thought it was early spring, but now we're back to heat and humidity. Ugh. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, staying inside. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. 2022 AWRL Field Day lit up the bands from coast to coast this past weekend, and AWRL headquarters has already received over 2,400 entries submitted via the online Field Day entry web application. From California to Nova Scotia, Field Day lit up the bands last weekend. Scores are pouring into the AWRL, and with more details on what has been received so far, we go to John Ross. KB8IDJ, who files this report from League Headquarters. Early analysis reveals that most of the entries participated as Class D, that's home stations, and Class E, home stations using emergency power. As of June 30th, the breakdown of field day entries by class showed 2,723 total entries, with 272 in Class A, 361 in Class B, 32 in Class C, that's mobile, 1,524 in Class D, 484 in Class E, and 50 in Class F. 
So far, a total of over 517,000 contacts have been reported for the event. And those numbers are changing daily. In 2021, there were 1.5 million contacts made during the field day activities. Many participants were keeping their hopes up for better propagation as early forecasts were looking promising. ARRL contest manager Paul Bork and one SFE said that propagation aside, there was substantial activity. While band activity and conditions might not have been the greatest, there was a good amount of activity on all of the bands. Many participants seem to agree that the recent rule changes, capping transmitter power output to 100 watts, was a good idea. There is still plenty of time to submit your 2022 field day entry. Participants who submit their entries using ARRL's online submission form can earn 50 bonus points and will receive an email confirmation of their completed entry. Be sure to check the entries received webpage to verify your entry status. And be careful of this. If it indicates pending documents, the required dupe sheet or in lieu of that, a Cabrillo log file or other supporting documentation of uh, the claim bonus point is missing. So check that carefully. Participants can edit or add documentation to their online submissions by using the link provided in the confirmation email. And field day entries, by the way, must be submitted online or postmarked no later than 2059 Universal Coordinated Time on July 26th, 2022. Christy Maluzzi has made a commemorative field day cake for each of the last three years featuring the event's logo. She recently married Andy Maluzzi, KK4LWR of Claremont, Florida. Andy is a member of the ARRL Public Relations Committee and co-advisor to the ARRL Collegiate Amateur Radio Program. Dustin Lomax, KF7FK, reported in his Soapbox comments that it was his first field day in which he used CW, adding that CW was a fun change of pace that really helped make the most of marginal band conditions in western Washington. 2022 field day was highly promoted thanks to the efforts of many ARRL division and section volunteers, amateur radio clubs, and their members. Many states and counties obtained special proclamations from local governments designating the weekend, in some cases the whole week, as Field Day and Amateur Radio Week, recognizing the many contributions of amateur radio operators during emergencies and with serving their communities. ARRL treated participants with a live video stream from W1AW, its headquarters station, throughout Field Day. Life member Carl Schwab, KO8S of Warren, Michigan, was delighted with making contact with W1AW during Field Day. I heard W1AW calling CQ Field Day on 20-meter single sideband, wrote Schwab. I responded and then heard Kilo Oscar 8 Sierra, your 5 Foxtrot, Connecticut. I responded with my report and got in their log. After Field Day and uploading my log, I went to the ARRL website and there I found a four-hour video was available on YouTube showing W1AW during their Field Day activities. While watching this video, at hour 2, minute 55, I heard and saw my live contact with them. This was a special moment for me, one I will never forget. A recording of the W1AW live stream is available on the ARRL's YouTube channel. Today, the Federal Communications Commission FCC, granted SpaceX authorization to use its Starlink satellite internet system on vehicles in motion, including cars, trucks, boats, and aircraft. It's a big win for SpaceX's Starlink system, potentially opening up the service to a more diverse range of use cases and customers. SpaceX requested regulatory approval from the FCC in March of last year to allow Earth stations in motion ESAM, Starlink terminals to be used in moving vehicles. To tap into the system and receive broadband internet coverage, customers must purchase a personal ground-based antenna or user terminal that is designed to connect with any orbiting Starlink satellites that happen to be overhead. Up until now, those dishes have had to remain in a fixed location in order to access the system. Now, the FCC has granted SpaceX's request as well as one from another satellite company, Kepler Communications, paving the way for a new class of user terminals that can connect to broadband beaming satellites while on the move. While doing so, the FCC chose to deny a petition from Dish Network that sought to prevent the companies from using frequency in the 12 GHz band. However, the FCC will continue to conduct analysis as it moves forward with rulemaking on the presence of ESAM devices in the 12 GHz band and said Kepler and SpaceX will be subject to any future rules it sets. The FCC argues that approving the new capability is in the public's interest. We agree with SpaceX and Kepler that the public interest would benefit by granting with conditions their applications, the FCC wrote in its authorization, dated June 30, authorizing a new class of terminals for SpaceX's satellite system will expand the range of broadband capabilities to meet the growing user demands that now require connectivity while on the move, 
whether driving an RV across the country, moving a freighter from Europe to a US port, or while on a domestic or international flight. Starlink is SpaceX's ambitious initiative to launch a constellation of thousands of satellites into low to medium Earth orbit in order to provide low latency broadband coverage to the Earth below. The company has more than 2,400 satellites in orbit so far, and after coming out of beta testing near the end of last year, the company recently boasted that it had 400,000 users. SpaceX has made it clear that it wants to expand Starlink beyond just residential customer use, though. The company has been negotiating with various airlines about using Starlink internet service and has deals with Hawaiian Airlines and private jet service JSX to start providing internet connectivity on their aircraft over the next couple of years. Additionally, Starlink just rolled out a new special service tier for RVs, allowing users to connect with Starlink satellites from multiple locations like campsites or vacation cabins, with no assigned home address for an extra fee. Though, at the time of the announcement, subscribers could not use the dishes while their RVs or vans were moving. 2022 Ham Radio, the International Amateur Radio Exhibition, held last weekend, June 24th through the 26th, in Friedrichshafen, Germany, drew enthusiastic crowds and amateur radio enthusiasts from 52 countries. Messe Friedrichshafen Managing Director Klaus Wellmann and Project Manager Petra Rathgeber said the event attracted 10,200 participants. While attendance was down from the 14,300 in 2019 because of COVID, visitors and exhibitors were upbeat, a sentiment reflected in the event's slogan this year, Seeing Friends Again. Together with our outstanding partner, the German amateur radio club DARK, we have put on a top-notch trade fair with a wide-ranging supporting program, said Wellman and Rathgeber in a joint statement. There were 129 commercial exhibitors and associations with 265 flea market exhibitors from 27 countries. DARC press spokesperson Stephanie Hine, DO7PR, and DARC chair Christian Ensfeldner, DL3MBG emphasized the event created a unique space for meeting others in person and fulfilled its role as a driver of the future of amateur radio. Together we laid the foundation for the regional emergency radio groups at the fair, and we will launch a nationwide concept for emergency communications in the near future, said Hein. ARRL was among the participating International Amateur Radio Union member societies exhibiting at the convention. Representing ARRL in Germany was President Rick Roderick, K5UR, and his wife Holly Roderick. ARRL CEO David Minster, NA2AA. Director of Operations Bob Nauman, W5OV, and Director of Public Relations and Innovation Bob Inderbitzen, NQ1R. Nauman led a team of ARRL volunteers who supported DXCC card checking at its stand, a service that's very popular within the international ham radio community. An ARRL VEC administered exam session was held during the convention in Germany, supporting visitors seeking to take the U.S. Amateur Radio Service license exams. The ARRL volunteer examiner team included Manfred Lauterbaum, K2PZ, Vivian Lauterbaum, KD5VL, Frank Kozadowski, K6OE, Jean-Luc Missler, AK8DX, Timothy Sass, KD8BLT, and Charlie Bala, AC88QT. It was fantastic to visit with so many members and friends in Germany, said Inderbitzen. He noted that ARRL has thousands of international members. QST magazine is among the most recognized amateur radio journals in the world and draws many hams to ARRL for membership, he said. Other popular membership benefits include ARRL equipment testing and QST product review. Our entire suite of digital magazines, including QEX, the National Contest Journal, On the Air, and member pricing for popular ARRL awards. 
An institute will be a platform for hams, makers, and professionals to work together on new technology projects in Austria. WRAN will supply a way for access from 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 meters into the Europe wide hamnet, which is a 2.4 and 5 gigahertz ham radio high speed RF data network. A LoRa based network linking low power Internet of Things, or IoT, devices using the QO-100 satellite will enable data communications between devices across a third of the world's surface. He also noted ARRL's role in protecting and promoting amateur radio worldwide and as Secretariat for the International Amateur Radio Union. A short video tour from the convention is posted to ARRL's YouTube channel. The next ham radio event will be held in Friedrichshafen, Germany, from June 23rd to the 25th, 2023. For two days in mid-June, over 100 amateur radio operators were joined by the United States Geological Survey, local county law enforcement agencies, and the NCOM Training Organization for participation in a functional earthquake exercise in Southern California, known as SoCal Shifting 2022. The goal of the exercise, which took place from June 18th and the 15th, was to test the operational capabilities and readiness of the Winlink Global Radio Email System using amateur radio frequency. Oliver Duffy, K6OLI, the District Emergency Coordinator of the Amateur Radio Emergency Service, Los Angeles District, said the exercise came together quickly over five days and with the help of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, the Disaster Communications Service, the San Diego Aries, and the Ventura County Aries. Billy said amateur operators routinely hold weekly tests but need to be network aware and used to the battle rhythm during emergencies to move traffic in a more timely manner. The exercise scenario consisted of a cluster of earthquakes occurring on June 18th at 10.18 a.m. and amateur radio operators were asked to send a series of messages ranging from a did-you-feel-it report to a field station. Dolly said the exercise was a great success, stating that participants were only given a short three days notice, so the great success of the SoCal shifting functional exercise again demonstrates the value of regular mission-focused training and collaboration. Dolly said the numbers from the final after-action report were outstanding. The Aries Los Angeles Northeast District Tactical Call Sign received 372 messages, from 101 participating stations during the exercise. 76 of the stations sent all four messages, 16 sent three, the remainder sent two or fewer. The Windlink checkout was the most overlooked. Over 95% of stations correctly located themselves in North and Central America. Three stations missed a call sign in their longitude, in some but not all of their form submissions. Two stations elected not to send latitude and longitude. Over 95% of those entered the correct exercise name in the Did You Feel It form, and that was of special importance as it helps United States Geological Survey aggregate and analyze exercise data. The exercise scenario and a brief after-action review is available online. The Hurricane Watch Net is keeping a close eye on a new developing storm system, the potential Tropical Cyclone 2. This system was expected to affect the islands of Curaçao and Aruba, as well as the northern coast of South America early Thursday morning, June 30, 2022, with sustained winds of 50 miles per hour or 80 kilometers per hour. This system is expected to become a Category 1 hurricane late Friday evening, July 1, 2022, when it will be around 110 miles or 177 kilometers east of Bluefields, Nicaragua. Located over the southwestern Caribbean Sea, advisories have been issued with the chance of formation through Friday, July 1, 2022, at 90%. Tropical storm warnings have been issued by the governments of Nicaragua for the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua, from the Nicaragua and Costa Rica border, northward to Sandy Bay, Serpi, and Costa Rica for the Caribbean coast of Costa Rica, from Limon northward to the Nicaragua and Costa Rica border. As of Thursday, June 30th, 2022, the hurricane watch net has not been activated, but as the situation changes, activation notices will be sent 
via the private email listing as well as posted on their website at www.hwn.org. As a reminder, when activated, the Hurricane Net will be on 14.325 MHz upper sideband by day and 7.268 MHz lower sideband by night. When propagation dictates, both frequencies will be used simultaneously. DX Engineering has announced that it has added Penta Laboratories RF vacuum tubes to its product line. In the ham radio community, special RF power vacuum tubes are essential replacements for current model amplifiers. They are also used to revive legacy amplifiers, and some technically savvy operators built vintage-style homebrew equipment and other devices using vacuum tubes. Penta Laboratories described that it was founded in 1951 and quickly achieved industry-wide recognition for the development of the beam power pentode vacuum tube. The company stocks thousands of tubes for a range of disciplines, including vacuum tubes designed for ham radio and other radio frequency applications. Penta Laboratory states that their tubes are burned in for a minimum of 48 hours, dissipating full power with filament, plate, and support screen voltages that are normally used in amplifier applications. International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring Newsletter reports that in May they observed almost the same trend as in previous months, and more specifically since the end of February 2022, in terms of emissions sent by intruders in the HF amateur radio bands. Radars continue to be the most numerous and harmful intrusions in our bands. The Russian over-the-horizon radar container tops the list of the most frequently received radars, followed by the Iranian over-the-horizon radar, which broadcasts daily on 28.860 MHz, and by the British radar located at the Sovereign Base area in Cyprus. But also, coinciding the beginning of the war in Ukraine these last months, and also during May, the monitoring station has also been receiving signals whose function we have not yet been able to identify. As these signals are unknown, we report them as XXX. The most common one has a bandwidth of about 8 kHz, seems to consist of a central carrier, and is most frequently found in the 20 and 40 meter bands. Another example of this type of signal whose precise function we do not know yet, is one that has been received several times on 40 meters with a bandwidth of about 12 kHz. Within what we unfortunately considered to be more common signals, numerous emissions were received in various CIS and FSK modes on different frequencies, mostly in the 40 and 20 meter bands. We were also able to receive several CIS-12 transmissions, as well as DPRK-FSK-600-ARQ and DPRK-PSK-1200-ARQ, most of the time received on the 20 meter band and a Link 11 DSB signal on 7.159 MHz, among other well-known MIL modes. Broadcasting stations continue to cause damage to the amateur radio HF bands. An example of such broadcasts is Ethiopia Radio on 7.110 MHz AM. In Sweden, the Grimaton radio station is opening its doors to visitors at last this year, but its historic transmitter must stay off the air. According to the Alexanderson Association News, for the first time since the pandemic began, the Alexander Association in Sweden will be welcoming visitors to Alexanderson Day on Sunday, the 3rd of July, at the World Heritage Grimaton radio station. Unfortunately, the 98-year-old mechanical transmitter will be unable to get on the air. A note on the association website reports that a shortage of components prevents this Alexanderson Day tradition from happening. The 200-kilowatt transmitter with a call sign Sierra Alpha Quebec will be started up twice, and visitors to the radio station can be present, but no transmission will be made into the top-loaded vertical antenna customarily used for 17 kHz transmissions. The transmitter was developed by the radio pioneer Ernst Alexanderson of Sweden, who was an engineer at General Electric in the United States. It first went on the air in 1924. ARRL's new treasurer, John R. Sager, WJ7S, officially took office on May 1st of 2022, and he's already helping to plan the ARRL's financial future. 
With a close-up look at the league's new treasurer, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report from league headquarters. He brings with him over 40 years of financial management experience. He's a chartered financial analyst, a certified cash manager, and holds Bachelor of Arts and Master of Business Administration degrees from the University of Utah. And he's also a licensed extra-class amateur radio operator. So what led him to the ARRL? Well, he told us the ARRL is the best organization out there to advocate for ham radio interest and the best we have to ensure the hobby has a future. He also supports, uh, supports all of uh, what ARRL does, such as advocacy to protect antenna rights and everything they do to keep this privilege. He also said that with the additions of CEO David Minster, NA2AA, and President Rick Roderick, K5UR, ARRL has turned a corner, and he wanted to be part of that effort. He said he has two big passions in life, amateur radio and the financial markets. He said retiring after 40 years, he thought it was a perfect opportunity to give back to the hobby and continue two entrances that are close to him. Sager earned his technician and general class licenses in 2010 and 2011, his amateur extra class license in 2011. Today, CW is his uh, favorite mode. Welcome, John Sager, WJ7S, the new ARRL treasurer. Sager got his start in amateur radio as a shortwave listener. His family moved to Holland when he was 10 years old, where he found an old Zenith transoceanic radio. With a little rehab, including soldering and tube replacement, he was able to listen to stations from all over the world, including the many pirate stations of the day. He learned Morse code and was able to listen to the magic mode, CW, which piqued his interest in amateur radio. After returning to the States, he enjoyed visiting the ham shack of a friend's father and experienced many different modes of communication. One of his first priorities as treasurer working with a new investment management committee I believe in overseeing and monitoring the best investments over a long period of time to ensure ARRL survives and has the resources to pursue different ventures that come along in the future, he said. Sager hopes a solid investment program will result in a more effective strategy of attracting donors, ensuring ARRL has a legacy going into the future. Sager hopes that all the work will pay off great dividends that can help every amateur radio operator. Like many other retired professionals, Sager believes the hobby of amateur radio opens many other doors and opportunities. The man behind the highly successful company, Airhorn Technological Operations, has become a silent key. Dick Airhorn, W4EA, stroke W4ETO, started the company in 1970 and began production of the line of high-power Alpha RF amplifiers so popular in the amateur radio community. Dick was a lifelong ham. Mary Bittner, WB0PXM, said that Dick and her late husband, the Reverend Paul Bittner, who had held the call sign W0AIH, had been friends since their Minnesota high school days when they met through a school amateur radio club. She described Dick as a good friend and a man of faith. She said Dick, who was in failing health, died on Sunday, June 26th in Virginia. He was 88. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Uh, welcome. Good to see you. Is technology scary? Been one, I've been wondering this. We have a lot of movies about technology gone wild, you know, Terminator. There's a lot of movies about computers, you know, war games and computers just kind of, you know, gaining. I think the thing that scares us most is that like they'll they'll gain sentience. They'll be they'll be like aware. That's that's scary, I guess. HAL 9000 seemed nice at the time, seemed like a nice computer at the time. Didn't seem like a bad guy, kind of helpful. Could play a really good game of chess. And then it locked Dave out of the pod bay door, man. That's not cool, man. Not okay. Technology, I think, is neutral. I don't know. Is it? What do you think? I think it's neutral. I think it's, um, I think some people would argue, oh, no, technology is always good. And yeah, when it comes to things like, um, I don't know, zippers, those are good. Light bulbs, those are good. Although, I guess, you know, you can always, there's always the counter argument. There's a counter argument on zippers I won't go into, but there are some gentlemen who prefer not to wear zippers. There's also the issue of light. You know, we're not, our, our biology's not used to light 
between sundown and sunrise. And so, you know, all this, all this light, especially the blue kind, blue light, really bad. I mean, there's, so there's that. You could argue that there's some technology that seems pretty bad on the face of it, maybe the atom bomb, but there's still an argument there. I think it's basically neutral. It's what we do with it, right? And I was thinking about this this morning in the shower, which is my favorite technology. Thank you, Archimedes or whoever, <laughs> for figuring that one out. Nice job. We needed that. That was a that was a good uh, a good good catch. Good find. Shower bath. Actually, I've been reading a great book called Clean about the history of bathing. <laughs> he talks about the Middle Ages. He said some historians call it a thousand years without a bath. <laughs> It's a fascinating book. You know, our our, uh, our attitude toward cleanliness has shifted back and forth. Now, right now, we're all about being clean. Wash your hands, 20 seconds, right? We're all, isn't that weird? We're learning how to wash our hands like we didn't know. Like you have to have videos and new Apple Watch coming out sometime any minute now. Maybe even this week. It's got a little hand washing routine in it. Ah, I see you're washing your hands. Would you like some help? If you ask your Amazon Echo to play the hand-washing song, it'll sing a song for 20 seconds. A really terrible song. It makes you want to wash your hands faster. So the, I think medical technology, that's probably good, right? Well, yeah. I think it's what we do with it. And that's one of the things that has made my uh, career, really. It's, it's always been the principle behind what I do. And I've been doing this now since the 70s. Wow. Long time. Uh, which is, I like technology. I love technology. I like to play with it, right? But I also think it's important to understand it and to use it uh, intelligently, you know, that kind of thing. And I don't think if you, if I don't, I think if you don't understand it, then it, there's a tendency to say, oh, it's magic. That's probably not a good approach. It isn't magic, it's science. Technology, if you really think about it, is scientific theory made whole, made real, which is really cool. I'll give you a good example, the theory of relativity. Now you would think, well, that's blue sky. There's nothing that can do with that, right? We wouldn't have GPS if it weren't for the theory of relativity. GPS satellites have to account for the fact that they're moving and that they, uh, they have to adjust for the fact that they're at a different gravitational plane it's so all sorts of interesting things that we wouldn't be able to do without even stuff that seems so blue sky. So technology it wouldn't exist without deep scientific understanding. And that's the thing. If you don't, if you're scared of technology, well, <sighs> I understand. I don't, I don't blame you, I guess, but uh, surely we can, uh, we can figure it out together. So I guess that's kind of my job is not, is so to help you understand it, help you use it most importantly, because you know what, there, people are going to use it against us if we don't, we don't learn how to use it ourselves. So it's good to understand it. It is being used by governments and marketers and all sorts of ways that we may not approve of. So it's important to understand that. That's what we talk about. Uh, let's see, what else is uh, in the news? Can you trust third-party replacement batteries? Great question, and really, uh, it applies to more than just laptops, phones. Everything has lithium-ion batteries in it these days, uh, even some cars, your laptop, uh, your camera. And the problem with all lithium-ion batteries, in fact, all batteries in general, is eventually they wear out. Batteries generate electricity through a chemical reaction. In the case of rechargeables, it's a chemical reaction that can be reversed. So you reverse it. That's how you charge it up. Then it let it go. It generates electricity. Then you reverse it, and it generates electricity. But all batteries have this limitation that after a while, the chemistry starts to break down. And it starts, the first symptom is you can't quite generate as much electricity. The battery won't hold a, as much of a charge. And eventually, it stops holding a charge entirely. The chemical reaction is no more. So replacing lithium-ion batteries is pretty much a way of life. It's either that or replace the device. And for most of us, these devices are expensive. When you're buying a replacement battery, it's always safest to buy it from the original equipment manufacturer. Uh, if you're doing it for a phone from the company that made the phone, for a camera, the company that made the camera, because lithium-ion chemistry is a little bit dangerous. 
In fact, really, if you think about it, anything that can store a lot of energy in a small space and release it slowly could potentially become explosive if it released it quickly. Gasoline has that property. So does lithium-ion batteries. All lithium-ion batteries are packaged carefully so that they don't explode, although any lithium-ion battery, if punctured, has the potential to get very, very hot, sometimes burst into flames. And if the package containing it is sealed sufficiently, literally explodes spewing toxic chemicals all over the place. This is an undesirable result. And you may remember a few years ago, those hoverboards that all the kids were wearing, uh, were riding, uh, those had a big problem. Those had lithium ion rechargeables, but they were made in no-name Chinese factories. And in many cases, those rechargeables did catch on fire and cause significant damage. I have a good friend who's a, a judge here in Petaluma, had thirty or forty thousand dollars damage to her home. Thank goodness nobody was hurt from a hoverboard that burst into flames and uh, and caused a lot of damage. So we know lithium ion batteries can be dangerous. How are we protected? Well, if they're properly packaged, and most importantly, if they have circuitry that prevents overcharging. Uh, then they're generally safe. But even Samsung, you remember the problem they had with the Note 7. Apparently, in, in hindsight, it looks like they put too much battery into too small a space. When the batteries started to expand slightly, they would put pressure on the battery chemistry. And in some small number, but still significant number of cases, that pressure on the battery chemistry caused an explosion, overheating, flames and in some cases an explosion so even a big company like samsung that makes millions maybe billions of batteries a year can have this problem you want to make sure that you get the battery from a company that has a good reputation they will do the right thing in packaging and they'll put the circuitry in to prevent overcharging that's another way that these batteries can get in trouble in fact i think that that was what was happening to the hoverboards they were almost always catching fire when they were plugged into charge probably what happened was they overcharged and when a lithium-ion battery overcharges that's when it can also explode or burst into flames all batteries in your smartphones have circuitry that say ah i'm getting close to the top cut it off and so that's why you want to get a good battery. A cheap battery might eliminate that circuitry or might not be carefully packaged to prevent explosion, things like that. Anchor was a very good Chinese company that did seem to make very reliable batteries. There are other companies like Aukey. I've used their equipment, A-U-K-E-Y. And if you purchase from Belkin, Belkin is a company that actually resells batteries from companies like Anchor and Aukey. But there is at least an additional layer of quality control protecting you, uh, the Belkin name. So I think that's also a safe place. But almost always the best place to get your replacement batteries is from the original equipment manufacturer. If you do get a third-party battery, try to get it from a company that sells a lot of them, has good reviews on Amazon. Uh, you want to be very careful not to get it from just some no-name Chinese company. Those are the most likely companies to skimp on packaging or not provide the appropriate circuitry to protect you against an overheating battery. Overheating is your real challenge. So in most cases, the dangerous time is when the battery is plugged in and charged. If you do get a third-party battery and you're a little worried about it, keep an eye on it the first few times it charges. Make sure it doesn't get too hot. Uh, make sure it doesn't expand. That's another cause of failure in a lot of lithium-ion batteries. The bigger they get, as they get swollen, the more likely they are to rupture their packaging. And once the packaging is ruptured, almost always, uh, the next thing that happens is they burst into flame. It sounds pretty dangerous, but again, any technology that can store a lot of energy has the potential for releasing that energy all at once. We call that an explosion. And so uh, we have to find ways to keep our gas and our cars safe and our batteries and our devices safe. And I think in general, well-made batteries are very, very safe. There's no guarantees. Get it from a name that you recognize if possible. I don't have a name that I recommend other than Anchor or Aki because, you know, these companies kind of come and go. And almost all of them are Chinese uh, and perhaps not fully uh, regulated. Just buying it on Amazon is no uh, no protection at all. So look at the reviews and try to buy it from a company whose name you know. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech 
Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives here on This Week in Amateur Radio. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, with Amateur Radio History Headlines. 1925, the International Amateur Radio Union, the IARU, is formed. Amateurs finally are successful in working around the world on shortwave. 1926, crystal control of transmitters is developed. A federal court declared the Radio Act of 1912 to be unenforceable in regards to broadcasting and the shortwaves. The summer of anarchy commences in the broadcast world, but amateurs stay within their bands. 1927, the Radio Act of 1927 creates the Federal Radio Commission. The word amateur is used for the first time in a federal statute. The International Radio Telegraph Conference is held in Washington. Seventy nations send representatives. Amateurs, represented by the ARRL and the IARU, fight overwhelming odds, keep 160, 80, 40, 20, and 5 meters, gain 10 meters, but lose 37.5% of our overall frequencies. International call sign prefixes are assigned. 1929 through 1936. Despite the Depression, amateur radio enjoys its greatest growth from 16,829 to 46,850 hams. Low-cost components make it possible to build a quality station for $50. VHF phone operation becomes popular with the super regenerative receiver developed by Armstrong and the modulated oscillator. Phone operation begins to appear on some HF bands, but CW and crystal control are still number one. 1932, the Madrid Conference. Unlike the 1927 conference, this one has no changes to amateur radio. This has been Amateur Radio History Headlines with Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. Foundations of Amateur Radio A couple of weeks ago, a friend, Ben, Victor Kilo 6 November, Charlie Bravo, asked an interesting question on our weekly net. He wanted to know, if money wasn't a concern, what would your ideal shack look like? The answers varied widely, from leaving everything as is and using the money to retire, through to purpose-built fixed or mobile shacks, with worldwide DXCC activation travel and everything in between. My own answer was a little different. I envisaged establishing an RF research laboratory and spending my life exploring and investigating the ins and outs of the fundamentals of our hobby building software to find radios and building tools to leverage their capabilities. As far-fetched as money not being a concern might sound, it's something that a group of radio amateurs had to grapple with in 2019, when their group came into some money. The result is a private foundation with the aim to support, promote and enhance amateur radio digital communications and broader communication. The foundation, Amateur Radio Digital Communications or ARDC, uses its resources to provide grants to the amateur community. There's a number of criteria to be eligible to receive an ARDC grant, but you must at least relate to the support and growth of amateur radio, education, research and development. Grants are evaluated on a range of aspirational goals, things like reach, inclusiveness, innovation, social good and others. One of the first questions you might ask is, how did these people get the money and why they're giving it away? To answer that, we'll need to travel back to 1981, when Hank, Kilo Alpha 6 Mike, had the foresight to imagine that internet-style networking was going to be a thing, and requested a block of IP addresses for use by radio amateurs. If you're not familiar, an IP address is like a telephone number, but for a computer. Hank was granted a block of 16.7 million addresses. For decades, these were informally administered by a group of volunteers, working under the name of AMPRNet and later 44Net. In 2011, the group founded ARDC as a California non-profit and officially took ownership of the network space and its management. At this point, I'll make a slight detour into IP addresses. I promise, it's relevant. 
For information to travel to a computer on the internet, it needs to have an address. That address, originally specified using a 32-bit number, a so-called IPv4 address, made it possible to uniquely identify around 4 billion computers. With the explosive growth of computing and the internet, the world started running out of addresses, and in 1998, IPv6 was proposed to solve the problem. It uses a 128-bit number and has space to uniquely identify something like 340 trillion computers. In 2018, the ARDC was presented with a unique opportunity to sell some of its increasingly valuable address space due to IPv4 address scarcity, but soon to be worthless due to IPv6 adoption. After a year of internal discussion in the middle of 2019, the decision was finalized and the ARDC sold a quarter of the address block that Hank had been granted back in 1981. On the 18th of July 2019, Amazon Web Services became the proud new owner of just over 4 million new IP addresses. I should point out that radio amateurs haven't ever used more than half of the original block, and IPv6 is going to make this no longer any issue. So, how much do they make from this adventure? Well, each address sold for about $25, making for a lump sum of well over $100 million, which the ARDC used to establish its grants program. To round off the story, in 2020, the ARDC changed from a public charity to a private foundation and continues to administer the 44 net and the grants program. Their grants list is impressive and inspirational, so check it out on the ampr.org website. While you're there, you can subscribe to the newsletter and read about some of the amazing work that's flowing from the ARDC as a result of its efforts. At this point, you might be getting all excited about applying for a grant, and you should, but I'd like to ask a different question. What have you done lately to grow our hobby, to stimulate it, to encourage new people to innovate, research and learn? What has been your contribution? So, if you had money, what would you do with your amateur adventure? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. A pedestrian fox hunt was held during the June 21st, 2022 Athens County, Ohio Amateur Radio Association's Summer Potluck Picnic at the Southside Park Shelter. Kirk Guineville, the KC8JRV, hid several weak transmitters throughout the grounds in the park for hunters who showed up with their gear to zero in. After a 15-minute search of the grounds, Eric McFadden, WD8RIF, was able to locate the first of the transmitters hidden in a squirrel box and a brochure tray in an adjacent field. The weathered box had blended with an attached tree to form a perfect hiding spot. The warm, humid day was a deterrent for continuing the hunt to other transmitters, so the hunt was cancelled early. Where Athens earlier, fox hunters had been designed for a motor vehicle hunting. However, with the price of gas rising, it was decided that a hunt on foot would be more logical. Two dozen Athens County Amateur Radio Association members attended the picnic. This week's AMSAT report is in from Bruce Page, KK5DO. From the PICSAT team and you won SAT, we have learned that the PICSAT, a 3U CubeSat that was launched in January of 2018, went silent in April of 2018. That uh, CubeSat has come alive. First reports of the satellite were reported by Vlad, eu one sat on June 20th. Then on June 24, 2022, the PICSAT team reported successful commanding of the satellite. It has a 1K2 BPSK telemetry, and you can follow the recovery on their Twitter account at IAMPICSAT. Hopefully after the recovery, the FM transponder will be available. If you happen to make satellite contacts during the ARRL field day, AMSAT had their field day at the same time. To submit your score for AMSAT field day, the deadline is just ahead of the ARRL's deadline. Your AMSAT submission must be made by email to kk5do at arrl.net or kk5do at amsat.org by 11.59 p.m. Central Time on July 15, 2022. Scoring rules and submission sheets are available at amsat.org. Just click on events and a field day. It's time now for the weekly propagation forecast report brought to us each week by Ted Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who reports that solar activity took a dramatic plunge over the recent reporting week, which covered June 23rd to the 29th. 
but geomagnetic activity stayed exactly the same. Field Day weekend saw rising geomagnetic numbers with the planetary A index at 8, 16, and 23 Friday through Sunday. On Sunday, the geomagnetic activity was a problem, although not severe, with many stations at Field Day reporting increased absorption. The planetary K index peaked at 5, which is a big number, at the end of the UTC day on Saturday and continued into the early hours of Sunday. This happened because of a crack in Earth's magnetosphere. On June 26th, a big, bright CME billowed away from the Sun's southern hemisphere. A dark filament of magnetism erupted in the Sun's northern hemisphere on June 28th, but no CME was observed after the explosion. Short wave propagation conditions were relatively worse on June 26th and 27th. A dark filament of magnetism erupted in the Sun's northern hemisphere on June 28th, but no CME was observed after that explosion either. Short wave propagation conditions were relatively worse on June 26th and 27th, but after that they began to improve, but only very slowly due to the declining solar activity. Compared to the previous seven days, the average daily sunspot numbers declined from 124.6 to 49.1, while average daily solar flux dropped from 140.5 to 105.3. The planetary and middle latitude A index averages were both the same as the previous week, all numbers around 11. The prediction from the United States Air Force 557th weather wing is not very optimistic, with solar flux peaking at 140 on July 11th to the 16th. So looking ahead, the prediction shows 10.7 centimeter solar flux at 105 on July 3rd to the 5th, then 110, 120, 130, 135 on July 7th to the 10th, and 140 on July 11th to the 16th. Looking at the predicted planetary A index, it will be 5 on July 3rd to the 7th, then 8, 8, 12, and back down to 8 on July 8th to the 11th, 5 on July 12th and 13th, and 12 on July 14th to the 16th. More unsettled geomagnetic activity can be expected about July 3rd and 4th, and also at the end of the currently forecast period on July 7th. Then we expect geomagnetic activity at a quiet to unsettled level. Plenty of contests on tap for the uh, next 10 days. On uh, July 2nd, the Events in Whalen Independence Day contest, CW Phone and Digital. Then on July 2nd and 3rd, about seven contests. The Nazard Memorial Contest, CW and Phone. The uh, DLDX Riddy Contest, that's digital. Marconi Memorial HF Contest, CW. The Original QRP Contest, CW. The TA VHF contest, uh, TA uh, rather uh, VHF UHF contest, CW and phone. The Bodexas 070 Club 40 meter firecracker sprint, that's digital. Then on July 4th, a couple of events the OK1WC OK Memorial uh, CW contest, uh, CW only. And also on July 4th, the RSGB 80 meter club uh, championship, CW. On July 5th, the ARS Spartan sprint, CW. On July 6th, a couple of events, the A1 Club, AWT, CW, and the 144 VHF, UHF, FT8 Activity Contest, uh, FT8 there. On the 7th, three contests, that's on July 7th, uh, Walk for the Bacon QRP Contest, CW, the 1700 NRAU 10-meter Activity Contest, CW Phone and uh, Digital. And then uh, also on July 7th, the SKCC Sprint Europe, CW. On July 9th through the 10th, a couple of events, the IARU HF World Championship, CW, and phone. And then also on July 9th through the 10th, the SKCC Weekend Sprintathon, that's CW and phone as well. And for some upcoming section, state, and division conventions, on uh, July 2nd, uh, the Firecracker Ham Fest, that's hosting the ARRL Pennsylvania State Convention in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. July 15th through the 17th, the Glacier Wharton Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL Montana State Convention, that's in Essex, Montana. July 22nd through the 23rd, the uh, Ham Holiday 2022, hosting the ARRL Oklahoma Section Convention, that's in Oklahoma City, uh, Oklahoma. And on July 30th through the 31st, the ARRL West Virginia State Convention. The Spanish Amateur Radio Union, URE, in Galicia, Spain, has organized an event to commemorate the 2022 Jubilee of the Way of St. James with Amateur Radio. Diploma Zacobeo, 
2021 and 2022 Galicia for the World will take place July 18th through the 25th, 2022, and is a 1,500-kilometer walk along coastlines and through 10 public routes of landscapes and legends with hostels on the Camino de Santiago in Galicia. There will be 10 special event stations along the routes from July 18th through the 25th, and a diploma or QSL card will be issued for making all 10 contacts. On July 25th, special event station A02022 XAC will be activated and a separate QA3W1 diploma will be issued for contact with that station. For additional information, visit Galicia Zacobeo 2022. U-R-E dot E-S. A special event is underway to celebrate the life of a ham known globally as a man of adventure and compassion. The gifts of friendship, humanitarian gestures, and good DX that fill the life of Zoro Mayazawa, JH1AJT, are being celebrated by operators of a month-long special event station 3D2AJT in Fiji through to late July. Zoro, who had cancer, became a silent key in March of this year. Throughout his long amateur radio career, his de-expeditions helped put notable and coveted DX in the logbooks of hams around the world. Zoro was also known for his charitable work on behalf of children in Cambodia, Bangladesh, Japan, and elsewhere. The special event operators will be on the air using CW, SSB, FT4, FT8, and VAR AC. HF digital chat until the 27th of July, which would have been his 73rd birthday. According to the station's page on QRZ, the final day on the air will be marked with a farewell party organized by Zoro's widow at one of the schools her husband founded in Fiji. Do you struggle with the 24-hour clock and get confused when reference is made to UTC and GMT? What do those things even mean? Stick around to hear the big explanation. It'll be as clear as mud to you afterwards. First, to be able to understand and usefully apply UTC and GMT, your lot will be made so much easier if you get your head around the 24-hour clock and understand the offset of different time zones. So, without any explanation yet of what or how UTC and GMT are, let's just accept that both indicate the time at the prime meridian, zero degrees longitude, which is at Greenwich in London, England. The producer tells me that I must pronounce it Greenwich, not Greenwich, in my best received pronunciation. So here it is, Greenwich, in London, England. That needs to be accepted because time zones everywhere else are expressed as relative to Greenwich Mean Time. If the time zone is east of Greenwich, the offset's positive, and west it's negative. Because the world turns and time is more or less measured by the sun, that would raise a technical eyebrow or two, but let's just leave it at that for a minute and talk about what the time looks like in the 24-hour format. The 24-hour clock marks the day by beginning at 000 hours, which is midnight, and is expressed at 0 hundred hours, then begins counting. 1 a.m. is 0 100, commonly expressed as 0 100 hours, and so on. Noon is 1200 hours. 6 p.m. is 1800 hours, and so on until we set to 0 hundred at midnight. You need to note that the 0100 isn't a four-digit number, nor is it a base 10 number. It's two digits expressed alongside each other. From the left, the first two digits range from 00 to 24, marking the hours. The second two digits range from 00 to 60, marking the minutes. A third set of two digits can also be used, if desired, 0 to 60, to count the seconds. Now, let's look at how local time is set. Here in VK6, our time zone is Western Australian Standard Time, which is GMT plus 8 hours. So when it's midnight Greenwich Mean Time, e.g. 0 hundred hours, it's 0 plus 8 here in WA, which is 0 800 hours. If it's 1200 GMT, it's 12 plus 6, that's 1800 hours local. Do you get that? Simple arithmetic. Simply add 8 hours to whatever GMT is and you'll get our local time. To clarify, you take the numbers described in the first two digits and add 8. If that takes you past midnight, 0 hundred hours, just keep on counting. 2200 GMT becomes, one of my fingers, 0600 the next day here in VK6. 
I suggest you start thinking in the 24-hour clock for everything, and it becomes second nature. Try setting your watch, car clock, TV, computer, whatever you can, to the 24-hour format. You'll soon catch on. Now, for those whose brow has been creasing all over the GMT sun time thing, let me briefly explain. Firstly, Greenwich Mean Time isn't a time standard, it's a time zone. Let me run that by you again. Greenwich Mean Time isn't a time standard, it's a time zone. Greenwich Mean Time is the yearly average, or mean, of the time each day when the Sun crosses the prime meridian at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. Because the Earth isn't perfectly round and because it wobbles a bit, the mean time can go off ever so slightly over a period of time. We can't be having with wobbly time, so along comes Universal Coordinated Time, known as UTC. There are actually two main components to the Universal Coordinated Time Standard. Those are the International Atomic Time and Universal Time. TAI, or International Atomic Time, is a scale that helps develop the speed at which clocks should tick. It's found by combining the time of more than 200 atomic clocks located worldwide. It's pretty accurate, in other words. UTI, or Universal Time, is determined by the Earth's rotation. Because of that fact, it's also sometimes called astronomical or solar time. It's what timekeepers use to measure the length of a single day on the planet. Thanks to these two elements, UTC is used to synchronize clocks in various countries around the world across 24 different time zones. Universal Time was actually created during the Washington Meridian Conference held in 1884. This is when the idea of a 24-hour time zone concept we currently use came into fruition and became adopted widely. Before that time, Greenwich Mean Time, or GMT, was actually the world standard. However, it wasn't until 1960 that the International Radio Consultative Committee came up with the concept of coordinated universal time. Just a year later, in 1967, it was officially adopted as the primary timekeeping standard. Greenwich Mean Time isn't considered a standard anymore, yet it is the label of one of the 24 total time zones on Earth, used by countries in Africa, Western Europe, and the UK during the winter season. Amateur radio operators were among those in attendance during a disaster risk workshop held jointly on Friday, June 24th, by organizations in India and Japan. Attendees were there to tackle the challenge of communicating with the press about disasters. Specialists from Japan and India teamed up for a full day of presentations hosted by the Press Club of Kolkata. Both nations' governments gave their support to the event, which also marks 70 years of diplomatic relations between Japan and India. Described as a media sensitization program, it united responders, government agencies, and media managers to discuss various aspects of handling information and news coverage about risks during disasters. The 13 Colonies special event, one of the amateur radio calendar's most popular activities, starts calling QRZ starting Friday, July 1st at 1300 UTC. Operators will be based on each of the original 13 United States colonies and at bonus stations in England, Pennsylvania, and France. The event runs through July 8th at 0400 UTC. The event honors the original 13 colonies that fought for American independence and honors military veterans and those still active in the service. This 14th annual nonprofit event is also dedicated to Tom Francis W1 TEF, who had served as the state manager for South Carolina, which is using the special event call sign K2L. Tom became a silent key in March of 2020. For further details on the event, including the modes being used, visit the website www.13colonies.us. That's www.numeral1numeral3colonies.us. You can also visit the QRZ page for any of the colonies or for bonus station TM13COL in France, GB13COL in England, and WM3PEN in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. South Africa has welcomed its newest amateur radio operators following exam sessions for Class A and B licenses that were held recently. 74 who took the Class A exam successfully completed 60 multiple choice questions, according to the South African Radio League. The Class A license permits a maximum of 400 watts of power. A Class B exam was held on June 11th, hosted by the ZS3ZU Hammies. 
All seven young operators who took the 30-question exam passed. To mark the occasion, three of the new amateurs took part in the Hammy Sprint being held the next day, Sunday the 12th of June, running the ZS3ZU station. The Class B license issued to operators younger than 21 permits a maximum output of 100 watts of power on HF, VHF, and UHF bands. The license is only valid until holders reach their 25th birthday. Concerns about radio interference have prompted two U.S. wireless carriers to delay part of the rollout of their 5G service. Despite findings from the Federal Communications Commission that 5G wireless service poses no risks to aircraft sharing different parts of the same C-band, two major U.S. cellular carriers have announced they'll be delaying their 5G rollout near airports with regional carriers. According to the trade magazine Aviation Today, the Federal Aviation Administration announced on June 17th that Verizon and AT&T have agreed to postpone parts of the rollout to enable airlines to assess whether their altimeters were free from interference and undertake any necessary upgrades. Aviation experts have said that some altimeters, particularly those used by regional aircraft, could be vulnerable to interference without a retrofit of RF filters on existing altimeters or installation of newer ones. The agreement delays the completion of the rollout until July of 2023. An article in Aviation Today said that the number of altimeter manufacturers are presently working on the development and testing of filters and installation kits. The trade group Airlines for America criticized the agreement for setting, setting what is called an arbitrary deadline and expressed concern over what might happen if the altimeter modifications were not available by July of next year. The chief executive officer for the trade group, Nicholas Callio, told the FAA's acting administrator, Billy Nolan, that he considered the agreement of a rushed approach to avionics modifications amid pressure from the telecommunications companies. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Hey, guess what? I can't see the VU meter for where I am, so I'm going to have to just kind of wing it. I wanted to do a segment for this series while working on a tower, but as usual, Mother Nature changed my mind. So here we are again from the comfy confines of good old Studio B. As winter sets in where you live, we're often reminded of those nasty little chores we put off all summer up on our ham towers, and I'm no exception to this rule. I always put off for winter what could be more easily done during the summer. The fall is actually a good time for tower work. In many parts of the USA, there are predictable dry spells during the change of seasons. The slowing of grass and weeds gives us a good chance to inspect the tower base bolts, clamps, and any grounding hardware. This is also a good time for spraying a good amount of herbicide around tower bases, grounding systems, fences, guy anchors, and other tower parts. It's also a good time to look down on the ground around the base of the tower for any parts that may have broken off during the summer storms that you may have not noticed from a distance. It's a good idea to always keep the tower base area free from debris and junk. So anything falling from the tower is immediately visible. Tell the person that mows the grass to always watch for stuff on the ground. Keep it picked up and report anything he finds on the ground. A clean gravel ground cover around the tower base is in your best interest as a tower owner or tower user. So go outside tomorrow and clean up everything around the base of the tower. Make sure everyone else that works around the tower does the same thing. This is one of the best ways to notice problems before they appear on the radio waves. This is the season for a final trip up the tower for a pre-winter inspection of the antennas, feed lines, waterproofing, and of the tower hardware too. Take the basic tower work tools, antenna work tools, and coax installing, securing, and waterproofing items too. Take your time and check every clamp, every coax connection on all sides. Jiggle everything with your hand to inspect for tightness. Be careful not to grab any active antennas while doing your annual inspection. It is not uncommon for things to vibrate loose during the year, and this may be your last chance to climb for months or more. So take care of it before winter's worst weather gets here. Sometimes that last climb of the year is during light rain or wind. I'll climb during some wind, but prefer not to. Sometimes I don't have a choice. If you're a once a year climber and have never gone up in a stout wind and are easily made seasick, you may want to reconsider climbing in the wind. On an unguide, self-supporting tower in the wind, 
the tower sways around, which causes you to feel dizzy and wobbly. When you're on the tower, above the tree line, there are no references around you to let you know that you're moving. And since the tower and you are both swaying at the same rate, while the tower may actually be swaying several inches, it looks like you're sitting perfectly still. This optical illusion can make your head spin or feel dizzy. If you're used to it, this, there's no problem. But if you're easily made nauseated and you're only holding onto the tower with your hands, it could cost you your life if you suddenly had to vomit while climbing. So if you're the kind of person who gets motion sickness easily, you may want to avoid climbing during winds more than a gentle breeze. Just be patient and wait for better weather. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. And finally this week, and we like this, let's go shopping for CUSOs at Walmart. One of the more zany on-the-air events is back for its third run. Walmart Parking Lots on the Air will be held on July 2nd from 0000 UTC to 2359 UTC to coincide with the birthday of the famous chain of American stores. The exchange must take place on an amateur radio satellite and include the call sign and either the Walmart store number or grid square. Activators, or associates as they're called by the event organizers, are asked to use the store number to reduce duplicate contacts. Rules and award information are online at WMPLOTA.org. Again, Whiskey, Mike, Papa, Lima, Oscar, Tango, Alpha.org. So don't miss out on bonuses like the birthday special or the MacGyver. Put on your pajamas and aluminum foil hat, grab the rig, and head to a store parking lot near you. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD repeater system, on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Audio News Service, and the ARRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service. AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom. The South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority. The New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, The Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at TWIAR.net. 
And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5WLR in Fayetteville, Arkansas, wishing you 73.